Okay, thank you very much, Alessandro, for having me here. Um, I hope it's okay with the mic, otherwise you tell me who if you make signs. Good. So, extreme poverty as a violation of human dignity and might in some situations constitute a threat to the right to life. That is what the UN General Assembly has stated in 1992. This formulation puzzled me. Here, the UN General Assembly does not qualify extreme poverty as a human rights violation. It qualifies it, instead, as a violation of human dignity, and under some conditions, a threat to, not a violation of, the right to life. There is a tension between the evaluation of human dignity and the right to life. One might get the impression that the addressed violation of dignity is weaker than the threat of human rights violation of the right to life. This puzzled me even further since in prominent cases that might, might come to mind when violations of human dignity are concerned, we might think of severe forms of torture, rape and degradation. In these cases, a violation of dignity seems to be even more serious than a violation of the right to life. So I'm German, and in the German constitution, human dignity has a very high rank, and therefore it's absolutely forbidden to torture any terrorists, even if you can save a number of innocent lives, but it's of course allowed um, for a policeman to execute a final rescue shot in order to save innocent people. So it seems that human dignity is even more important in the German constitution than the right to life is. So that puzzled me. But for the context of extreme poverty, this does not seem to be true. On the one hand, extreme poverty is often seen as incompatible with human dignity or even as a violation of human dignity, but this does not seem to imply that there is a right to some goods that are necessary for subsistence. Society accepts that actively harming someone is forbidden, but whether aiding in poverty relief is compulsory or not is extremely controversial. To not help people who suffer from extreme poverty is often considered a mere violation of an imperfect duty of beneficence that is considered to be normatively weaker than a duty not to harm. I think that if extreme poverty is addressed as a violation of human dignity, we should differentiate, and that's my thesis here, between two aspects of human dignity. The first aspect refers to the unconditional normative status of persons, and the second aspect refers to the empirically conditioned possibility to lead a decent life. And I think the first one is more in the German tradition, and the second one is more in the Anglo-American tradition. <coughs> I will hold that both aspects must be concerned in order to qualify a state of affairs as a violation of human dignity. So the aim of my talk is that if we speak of poverty as a violation of dignity, is that possible and how can we reconstruct that? Okay, my presentation has three parts. First, I will ask what it means to lead a decent life. Then I will ask what it means not to respect the equal status of persons. And finally, in the third part, I will then give an idea of what it means to consider poverty as a violation of dignity. Okay. So, yes. Here we go. First part, what does it mean to lead a decent life? In this section, I will have a closer look at what it means to lead a decent life. I think that this aspect is addressed by the UN General Assembly as well as in the often quoted report from the former World Bank President Robert McNamara. He states, poverty at the absolute level, which is what literally hundreds of millions of men, women, and most particularly children are suffering from in these countries, is a life at the very margin of physical existence. Absolute poor are severely deprived human beings struggling to survive in a set of squalid and degraded circumstances almost beyond the power of our sophisticated imaginations and privileged circumstances to conceive. 
This statement focuses on the fact that poverty means a life at the very margin of physical existence. This idea is also addressed in the um, beginning thought by the UN Assembly when they qualify poverty as a threat to the right to life. They posit that there is a set of squalid and degraded circumstances that extreme poverty is combined with. So here I come in with Abishai Magalit, who considers dignity as another world for self-respect. So I try now to explain what it means to lead a decent life. The connection between dignity and self-respect is also central for my colleague Peter Schaber's work on dignity. We can differentiate between three dimensions of self-respect. First, there is self-determination in the sense of the possibility to select between acceptable alternatives. Secondly, there is self-evaluation, as Rawls points out. He writes, it includes a person's sense of his own value, his secure conviction that his conception of his good, his plan of life, is worth carrying out. Furthermore, self-respect implies an ability, so far as it is within one's power, to fulfill one's intentions. Now, both these dimensions include the wish to be acknowledged by others, and a necessity to be positively evaluated by others. According to Rawls, self-respect is the most important basic good for a good life. Beyond these aspects, which refer to a good human life, self-respect has a moral dimension. Kantians would speak of moral autonomy here. For a Kantian, self-respect means to acknowledge oneself and others as beings that are able to act morally that are able to put themselves under moral laws. In this respect, Kantians consider autonomy as the ground for dignity. So as you might have already realized, um, I have a double strategy here. So I would say to do this only from a Kantian standpoint. So we would miss the empirical aspect that I point now out here in this first part of my paper. And to do it only from the Magalit perspective, we would miss the Kantian perspective that we also need. And I will now show this. For what I will describe here as a violation of human dignity, Magalit uses the term humiliation. The important observation in our context is that there are two senses in which the term humiliation and hence violation of dignity can be used. The first that I will adopt here goes back to the differentiation between misfortune and injustice. We can only speak of an injustice, a violation of someone's small or legal rights or claims, if other human beings are involved who have violated their duties, or if unjust institutions are in place which systematically deny someone equal respect, equal rights, and life prospects. The same applies to violations of dignity. Now, so now the problem will be um, that conditions of poverty are described as humiliating, but from this it does not follow that these conditions arise from a violation of dignity and it does not follow that a perpetuation of these conditions is a violation of dignity. So now comes a quote and my interpretation. The term humiliation from Margalit refers, um, which Margalit refers to is ambiguous, since not only behavior is liable to humiliate people, conditions of life are also capable of providing some reasons for feeling humiliated. Conditions are humiliating, however, only if they are the result of actions or omissions by human beings. Conditions ascribed to nature cannot be considered humiliating on my view. So Margaret uses the term humiliation synonymous with what I refer to as a violation of human dignity. The latter, for me, seems to be more precise since Margaret affirms that there is also a common secondary metaphorical sense in which people see the very conditions of human existence 
such as old age, handicaps, or ugliness, as reasons for an older state's feeling humiliated. And now, but that's just, you know, um, a matter um, of how we speak about things and not um, the matter itself. But I would propose that humiliation is for feeling humiliated, and then what is a violation of dignity, that's uh, what Magalit reserves the term humiliation for, so like uh, if other people are involved, but uh, as a matter of fact, he makes the same distinction as I do. So um, the secondary sense involves humiliation as a result of natural life conditions, and in this sense, humiliation does not constitute a violation of dignity. Okay, so my second thesis is that loss of control can be humiliating, but it is not necessarily a violation of dignity. This is only the case if it is due to the acts of others, like torture, exploitation, slavery, and natural dependency, or is leading to the loss of acknowledgement by others, for example, caused by dependency, or it is constituting a violation of moral autonomy, that is, non-respect of the equal moral status of other persons. So humiliation as a violation of dignity has two aspects. The physical one that can manifest itself as a loss of control over one's body or one's life conditions. This loss must be combined with the loss of being acknowledged by others in order to constitute a humiliation or a violation of dignity, in my use of the term. For Margalit, this is understood as the denial of the ability of freedom that constitutes the deciding feature of a human being. And I here would propose to go on Kantian ground with that. Okay, so here we go. A decisive aspect of a violation of dignity consists in the non-consideration of the equal moral status of persons. So if that condition is not fulfilled, we don't have a violation of human dignity. And the description of severe poverty as a condition beyond decency, like from McNamara, is not sufficient to qualify it as a violation of dignity. Right. So, now, second part, what does it mean to not respect the moral status of persons? Yeah. Many philosophers hold that the decisive feature of the non-consideration of the equal moral status of other persons consists in their instrumentalization. Now, I choose a quote from Martin Nussbaum in order to illustrate that. She writes, rape violates the bodily, mental, and emotional life of a woman or man, affecting all her or his opportunities for development and functioning. Rape, we might say, does not remove or even damage dignity, but it violates it, being a type of treatment that inhibits the characteristic functioning of the dignified human being. It is inappropriate to use a human being as a mere tool in that way, because a human being should not be used as a mere tool. Respect for human dignity prevents that. So she's absolutely in the Kantian terminology here. Others hold that in the case of torture, especially the person who is tortured is treated as a means in order to get information. I heard that yesterday on one talk. I don't remember who it was, but we had it already here. But this is what, uh, this is what makes torture or rape no, sorry. But is this what makes torture or rape such a moral evil, I ask now? That a person is treated as a mere means would also be true if there were no physical harm done. For example, if you falsely promise to release a person in order to make her hand over some information. Or, for example, if you administer a truth serum, so there is no physical harm done, but you still instrumentalize the person. And on Kantian terms, all false promises are instrumentalizations, like the false promise to give the money back tomorrow that you borrow today. 
but they are not necessarily humiliating, I would state. They constitute violations of the other person as a moral being whose ends deserve respect within the consideration of what ends we can legitimately follow insofar as they violate the first aspect of dignity. But they do not necessarily involve a violation of the second aspect, the ability to lead a decent life. So that's important now. Yeah? The prohibition of instrumentalization, I say, is too broad to determine relevant violations of human dignity. Because then we inflate the term violation of human dignity, we apply it to all false promises. Okay, that's thesis five. And now we come closer to the core of my talk. On the other hand, the prohibition of instrumentalization seems too narrow to determine relevant cases of human dignity violations. Extreme poverty is not necessarily a form of or result of instrumentalization. Here, the second aspect of dignity is affected, so to lead a decent life. But the first aspect, the violation of respect for the equal moral status of other persons, is not solely viol violable by instrumentalization. Yeah. Nevertheless, slavery and exploitation that often accompany severe poverty do constitute extreme forms of instrumentalization. Now, for example, Les Ashford and James Griffin have recently pointed out that people who are suffering from severe poverty are extremely vulnerable to such forms of instrumentalization, like slavery and exploitation. But the moral problem of extreme poverty is not solely explicable through reference to instrumentalization or the danger of vulnerability to instrumentalization, I say. So take this example. If firm X offers child labor in Bangladesh, then per Ashford's account, the poor are forced to waive their human rights if there is no other opportunity to survive. They are forced to not insist on having their human rights, rights that should protect them against such treatment. Still, it is not necessarily a solution to simply forbid firm X from offering child labor in Bangladesh. <coughs> Doing this, forbidding child labor and uh, forbidding firm X to offer it, would be a good step toward protecting human rights because it may ensure that the children are not exploited anymore. From a moral point of view, if the poor are not instrumentalized by firm X anymore, this would also be an advantage. But, and now here comes my point, in the end, the poor would still suffer from severe poverty. And now the question is, is that if they are not exploited anymore, but do still suffer from severe poverty, still a violation of dignity? So, if extreme poverty does not go back to instrumentalization or makes the poor vulnerable to the threat of instrumentalization, is there still a violation? Severe poverty in the very early days of mankind seems not to go back on instrumentalization. As such, <coughs> it is questionable And I would say, this is not a violation of dignity too, so poverty um, 1,000 years ago. <coughs> so, because other human beings couldn't influence this. Peter Schaber uses here the example of a man who is shipwrecked. He's alone on a deserted island <coughs> where he can find nothing to eat. His options are extremely restricted. He has no choice. He will sooner or later die of starvation or illness. Still, since there are no other human beings around, there is no violation of dignity in the situation. And according to Margaret's definition, there is also no humiliation. Severe poverty as such does not constitute a violation of dignity. Severe poverty means a life beyond decency, 
in the sense that people are lacking essential goods that would be necessary to lead a decent life. But so far, we can only speak of a violation here if other human beings brought these circumstances about or instrumentalized the poor who are vulnerable to instrumentalization because they do not have much choice. What about, and now here it comes, cases in which other human beings are involved, not by instrumentalizing the poor, but by not helping them? Not helping someone does not seem to infringe upon the prohibition of instrumentalization. Is it possible that it constitutes a violation of human dignity nevertheless? And here comes the core of my talk and the Kantian account. So I would claim that we find tracks in that direction in Kant. And that is... Um, Good news, because a lot of Kant scholars, they refer to instrumentalization. And I'd say, well, that's too narrow. Now let's have a look at the categorical imperative that does not solely entail a prohibition of instrumentalization. Kant writes, so act that you use humanity, whether in your own person or in the person of any other, always at the same time as an end, never as a means. And here, I'd say, we can distinguish two infringements against this imperative. First, to use a person as a mere means. This excludes treating her as an end, like we have it in slavery, exploitation, rape, and torture. Second, to not use a person as a mere means, but also not to treat her as an end. If the moral status of persons plays a decisive role in the qualification of an act or an omission as a violation of dignity, and if it is possible to disregard the moral status of a person, not solely by using her as a mere means, but also by not treating her as an end, then there can be violations of dignity that cannot be explained as infringements against the prohibition of instrumentalization. No. Uh, now take this example um, for the second um, point, not to use a person as a mere means, but also not to treat her as an end. So take a famous example of a child drowning in a shallow pond, and you just walk along the pond on your way to work, and you do nothing. So you just let a child die. So you don't instrumentalize that child. So that would be really stretching the term of instrumentalization. Only Gerold Krauss, he does that. Yeah? But I don't know anyone else who would claim that. So uh, that is no instrumentalization, but it's still against this imperative because it means not to use the child, uh, not to consider the child as an end in itself. Because if we would treat her as an end in herself, we would acknowledge that her ends put, like Kant says, a stopping mark on my end. So if we have an end in itself here, we must consider the ends of the other person by pursuing our ends. So if I want to go to work through the park and someone is drowning and his end is to be safe and my end is to come as quickly as I can to work, then this end must be considered um, within my ends, and in this case, well, I must help the other person and go to work later. So that means to respect the other person in this case. And if I do nothing and just go on with my plan and walk to work, I don't instrumentalize the other person, but I also do not treat her as a nineteen herself, because that would have meant that I would have taken her ends into consideration and I would have stopped walking and saved her life. So that's my point here. And I think if we um, use this interpretation for um, this formulation of the categorical imperative, we have a possibility to also consider um, the cases of poverty that do not go back to instrumentalization or do not consist in instrumentalization or exploitation of the poor 
as violations of dignity in the sense that the poor are not treated as ends in themselves because they are not taken into consideration, although other people could have done that. So that's my point here. Okay. So the prohibition of instrumentalization is too narrow to cover all relevant violations of immediate. But now comes bad news. And uh, yeah, I have worked about this, so I'm pretty sure here. Uh, the requirement to treat others as ends in themselves is also too broad. It must instead refer to justified moral demands that refer to our double human nature and the conditions of a decent life. The content of the justified moral demands results from what we consider the conditions of a decent life. So that's the solution here. But that's not the Kantian solution, because Kant says, well, uh, and that's in the metaphysics of morals, he says, well, we have um, the end that is at the same time a duty for everyone, so to further others' well-being. But that's too broad. Because, I mean, uh, that's my example with my uh, co-author in another paper that we have about this. So maybe Gareth wants me to buy him an ice cream. And I don't buy him an ice cream, so I do not further his well-being. But I do not violate his dignity. So it must make a difference if I don't further others' well-being. Um, in what respect? And here my proposal is, and that's, well, uh, in order to improve the Kantian approach a bit. Like to say, well, but here we have to add the conditions for decent life. So if it's about that, then it's about a violation of dignity. And if it's about other things like buying Gareth and ice cream, it's not. Yeah. So that's my proposal here. OK. I'm almost approaching my conclusion, but we're not there yet. Upon closer inspection, even in the case of torture, the violation of dignity consists of the destruction of the possibility of self-determination. This is what the violation of dignity by torture has in common with the violation of dignity by severe poverty. The tortured person is actively deprived of self-determination. People in severe poverty who are lacking the objective goods needed for life in self-determination are, by destruction of these goods or by not providing for these goods, deprived of self-determination by others as well. So under these conditions, severe poverty can be classified as a violation of dignity. But what about relative poverty? that also can, like severe poverty, go back to the non-respecting of others as equal moral persons. Adam Smith distinguishes between necessary goods and luxuries. What qualifies a good as a necessary good depends on the standard of a society. Necessary goods are not only necessary for physical, but also for social survival. For example, he describes a necessary good in the 19th century England as owning shoes and a linen shirt without which one would be ashamed to appear in public. So Adam Smith considers necessaries to be not only those things which nature, but those things which the established rules of decency have rendered necessary to the lowest rank of people. We often refer to these rules of decency that are not met when we refer to poverty. That people cannot afford what is considered a decent standard of living is true not only for severe poverty, but also for relative poverty. So we have a huge discussion about this in Germany. So whether, for example, if children can't take play in extortions in school, whether they should get money for that because they're excluded otherwise. And here, one would, and that's my point here, we should not play 
severe poverty against relative poverty, because from the standpoint of severe poverty, we could simply say, well, that's a luxury problem. But I mean, from the standpoint of inclusion and exclusion and equal moral support, status is important. Okay. And it is relative poverty that Rose and Margaret, who I mentioned before, whose theories I have referred to, have in focus. For both of them, a life in self-respect depends on the acknowledgement of one's own life plan by others. Rose's solution to the problem of relative poverty is that differences concerning income and wealth are only legitimate if they have the best plausible effect on the least advantaged people within a society, as you all know. And this is founded in his idea that institutions are only legitimate if they are shown to express the equal moral value of persons whose life prospects they shape. That's paragraph 40 of the theory of justice. Also in Margaret's view, even more demanding, a society can only refer to itself as decent if it grants to its citizens extensive social rights that go far beyond the minimum of existence. So I think that we have two alternatives here. Either we restrict violations of human dignity to the violation and destruction of the equal moral status of a person, or non-providence for a necessary good as condition for a life and decency. As a result, severe poverty as a violation of human dignity would have the same extension as a violation of social and economic human rights. Yeah, that would be a narrow range. That is a common position, for example, represented by Griffin, Shaba, or Ivert. Or we stretch the conception in order to encompass relative poverty. We can discuss that, but there is only also a certain tension here. Another problematic um, point that I do not want to miss to mention is the fact that we do ascribe an indecent lie to poor people. And also McNamara does that and the UN Assembly. When this description leads to a self-description of a life beyond dignity in the first place, the ascription can lead to a violation of the self-respect of poor people. Furthermore, in this case, the ascription is self-fulfilling. On the other hand, with regard, with regard to a self-elected and self-determined life in poverty, as with a mendicant or an ascetic, the ascription is simply wrong. Here again, it becomes evident that the empirical aspect is not sufficient to detect a violation of human dignity, as I have mentioned before. Now well, I come to the end. Poverty is a violation of human dignity if poverty is so severe that the material conditions of self-determination are not given and if thereby the moral status of the poor is violated by others. This can be the case with exploitation as well as by not aiding the poor by providing necessary goods. Thank you for your attention.